Uh, good morning, everybody. So our second day starts with uh, Rosa with her second lecture. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So let, let me start by just quickly recall, recalling what I um, what I uh, finished with last time and the things that are going to matter to us. So um, we were working uh, on a toric Kaler manifolds, which were uh, manifolds, let me call them M, because I generally start with something I know. So suppose uh, I have a toric Kaler manifold, which is first of all a Kaler manifold, and then it's endowed with um, with a TN with the TN action, uh, which is effective and uh, has a moment map. That's that's the point of the toric setting. So this this moment map takes images in a convex polytope in Rn. It's called the moment polytope. And uh, okay, and uh, the upshot for me of this setting is that I get a very special set of coordinates on an open dense set of the manifold, which is the set where the action is free. And these coordinates come from the fact that precisely the action is free. So over that set, the manifold is just a product. And from this identification, I get action angle coordinates. So these are called action angle coordinates. So they, they are they are darbu for the for the uh, action, but um, but uh, what's really important for me today is that uh, they give you uh, coordinates which are appropriate for the metric in the sense that you can always write the metric as such. for a given function whose properties I was discussing last time. So let's see, it, it satisfies what I was say, calling one, two, three. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe remind you of the important ones now, but for now let's just, I just want to underline the fact that this function exists and U is called the symplectic potential. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do today is I sorry. What I want to do today is I want to develop a couple of tools. So I I actually want to discuss two tools that are going to be important in my third lecture. So they're 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 important for me, but um, I guess that more more than that, they are sort of um, important mathematical. They they are important in Kähler geometry, the two of them. And so even if you don't care about what I say, it's still there's still good toolboxes to have in your toolkit tools to have in your toolbox. So they're important in Kähler geometry. So let me start with the first one, which is uh, the Kalabi ansatz. It's kind of it's it's not very easy to talk about this because it's an ansatz, so it's hard to uh, write things in terms of, of theorems. What the Calabi ansatz is, is, it's a construction for uh, extremal metrics on, on uh, total spaces of bundles. Uh, 
and it's it's really very general but uh, I, I i will focus I will focus on on a very special case. And it's it's the following. So let me let me start by recalling something I, I was saying yesterday. So the important space for me is going to be O of minus one, which I was describing in the following way. It's the total space of the tautological bundle. And it can be, so the tautological bundle can be, it's so it's, I sort of talked about this yesterday, it can be expressed as a sub variety in, in the product variety like this. And uh, what I didn't say yesterday is that there is actually U2 acts in here. And it acts um, in the following way. Oh, okay, I crashed. It, it didn't go away. Um, um, Okay, so how does it act? So you, I, to give you a U2 element, I will give you a matrix. In fact, this would work for any matrix, but you'll see why I care about U2 particularly. So how, how does it act? Well, it acts on CP1 in the usual way. That is, it acts on homogeneous coordinates. So, okay, it acts on C2 and this descends. And it acts on the line. So it acts on the generator of the line in the, in the, in the obvious way. Okay, and um, because the matrix is in U2, then the quantity, the norm, in C2 it is preserved. And in fact, any U2 invariant function on O of minus one is just a function of this quantity. Okay, so, um, so another thing I want to say is that this U2 action extends the T2 action. Okay, so what do I want to say? Well, um, let's see. So it follows from Kalabianzats. In fact, this is just a, a, a small part of the ansatz. It follows that there is a U2 invariant extremal, so extremal, therefore, Kähler metric on a neighborhood of the zero section in O minus M. Okay, and this is the result I, I, I want to discuss for the half, for the first half of, of my talk. I sort of gave you all the tools needed to completely prove this. Uh, this is not the way Calabi wrote it. And uh, Okay, so so let me let me um, actually carry out this construction, which you know it's something I could call a proof, although this is not really a theorem. So it's let me let me explain how this goes. 
So uh, because these metrics, let, let, let's restrict to O of minus one. Uh, zero, the zero section is, is this. And um, uh, okay, so because these metrics are uh, because these metrics are u two invariant and u two extends the t two torus, the t two action, the metrics we are searching for are toric, and they have a symplectic potential as a consequence of that. Okay, so let me draw u1, u minus one for you. This is what it was. I'm not really drawing it, drawing its polytope. And the facets of this polytope are this one, this one, and this one, which is, well, let me, this one, goes like that. Okay, and because of this, I can write down, if you if you remember, I can write down the boundary behavior of you. It's this. So there's there's a singularity in you for each facet. The singularity is li log li and these are the allies, which I also drew. Okay, so this is the singular part, and then there is the smooth part. And my my claim is that this smooth part must depend only on x1 plus x2 if the metric is to be u2 invariant. And why is that? Well, if you if you if you remember. Uh, Invariant functions were functions of uh, the the sums of the norms, and in action angle coordinates, if if you, I mean, you, you'd have to go back to the formula, but if you remember what the moment map is, this this sum of the norms is just x one plus x two. So the two invariant quantity is this x one plus x two which I'm going to call R. And it's going to play an important role because it is the, the uh, essentially only U2 invariant quantity. Okay, so let me rewrite this uh, again, slightly differently. So the symplectic potential is like this. It's some function. It includes a singularity at the at the facet where x one plus x two is a, but it's this. Okay, and we want we want the corresponding metric uh, to be extremal. And and the last thing I said uh, um, yesterday was that. Um, so the 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 corresponding metric oops, the corresponding metric is extremal if and only if the scalar curvature its scalar curvature is a fine it's an affine function of x1 and x2 But the metric is is uh, invariant under the U two action. So this affine function, which is the scalar curvature, must be invariant through the U two as well. So it needs to be of this form. So this is this this here is what we must solve, and I I I'm going to carry out the calculations for you mainly because I think it's impressive how, how simple they become. So uh, let me 
make space for that. Okay, so here. Uh, that's you. And if you recall, to calculate the scalar curvature, what I must do is, so this is the um, Abreu's formula. What I must do is I have to calculate the Hessian of U, its inverse, and then take derivatives of the entries of the inverse, you know, in, in the right positions. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Okay, so um, let me write this again. Okay, so the Hessian of U is what? Okay, so uh, there is a one over x1 that comes from this term, and then this term. The mixed derivatives are like that. Okay, now, now to calculate the inverse, I sort of need to calculate the, the, the determinant of this Hessian. In fact, this, this calculation is going to be useful in my fourth lecture as well, so Okay, so this determinant is, okay, there is a 1 over x1 times x2 term. There is this. And then the h prime prime squares cancel in, in, in the determinant, okay? So let me use that to calculate the inverse of the Hessian. Okay, so 2. Uh, well, in, in fact, I, let me simplify this a bit further. This is just, um, I can write this as this, if you reduce to the same denominator, it's a very easy calculation. Okay, so now I can use this determinant to calculate the inverse of the Hessian. Okay, so, it's the usual formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix that I'm using. So, but by, by, by the way, I, sh uh, I should have said, let me know if, if, there's, if, uh, there's, if there are any questions, I'm really happy to stop and, and uh, answer any questions at any time. Um, so this is uh, something I can simplify. And uh, let, me, let me write this in the following way. So maybe, maybe this simplification is, is a bit faster. You sort of need to think about it yourself. Okay, so there is a two here. Okay. And this Q is what, if, if, you, if it, 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 it follows from the calculations, that it's just, it's H prime primed one. So it's just, it has as much information as H prime prime. So I can, if I'm looking for an H, I can instead look for a Q. Okay, so now let me use the Abreu's formula. Uh, so the scalar is in this case minus, so the x1 squared, so I'm just making the, the general formula concrete for dimensions two. And now I'm going to apply to the matrix which I had in the previous page. It's, it's unfortunate that it's somewhere else, I guess. I can't, well. Let's see, well, it, it, it sort of, it, it becomes very simple. It becomes, so there, there is some of the, the X1 terms go away because they're linear and so their second derivative Spanish. So, um, So it was an x2 squared q. And then if you carry out these calculations, these are really, really elementary calculations. What happens here is this. 
Okay. Okay, so the upshot is that the the metric whose symplectic potential is u is extremal if and only if this quantity is affine in R. So is like this. And this is an OD. It's no longer a PD, it's an OD. And what's more, it's actually a pretty simple OD. If you you can have fun solving it if you if you get bored. You, the, the, right, the right substitution is Q over R cubed. And what I want to say is that the solution is, it, it gives you this. It's extremely concrete. Not, not R squared, but R cubed. Okay, so it comes in terms of a polynomial in one variable, a degree four polynomial, okay, whose term in R squared is, is R squared, but it's really very simple. So what, uh, what happens? So if, if um, let me, let me just put everything together, is, the symplectic potential of an extremal metric if and only if this H satisfies this. Let me write it again. And now I, I need to worry about the one, two, three for you. Okay, so let me start by worrying about two. That is the boundary behavior of you. Now, the, the boundary behavior must be, is determined by the facets. So whenever you have U is Li log Li close to one of the facets, then it's Hessian is like this, it's in one over Li. So if we want the right behavior at the facet, which is like this, so this facet, then this H, which is really what's going to determine the behavior of the Hessian must satisfy the denominator must be in one over R minus A. So gamma of A must vanish. And also, in fact, you know, you need a certain behavior of the derivative at the facet and this is what the behavior is. Okay, so it restricts A, B, C, and D. So this is uh, two. So then you need to worry about what I was calling one and three, which are convexity and what I was calling extra, which I never explained to you. And uh, I'm not going to go over the calculations. In fact, the calculations are a, bit, are, are a bit involved. But what I will tell you is that these account for the local. So the local in the statement. Of the ansatz. Okay. And this is this is uh, all I want to say about Kalabi ansatz. Are there are there any questions?
Okay, so uh, so Kalami used this to construct the first known examples. So they're explicit because as you see, the construction is extremely explicit. The first known explicit examples of extremal non CSCK metrics on uh, Herzebrook surfaces, which is, I was sort of describing these last time. It's I, I mean, you have everything you need to understand how he did this. It's, it's just instead of asking for a condition at A, you need an extra condition at, at, at some B. Okay. So I'm going to move to my next ingredient. But, but before I do that, I sort, of, um, I, I sort of want to say something about Einstein metrics. So I'm going to change gears apparently for, for, for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let me start with the definition. Okay, it's a flowery definition. Um, so suppose you have a Riemannian manifold. Um, it's said to be Einstein if it's um, if it's Ricci, it, it, so, okay, so if it's Ricci is proportional to the metric. So if there is a constant such that the Ricci of the metric is lambda times the metric. Okay, this is the 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 definition. So one of the first things to say about this definition is that. Um, Einstein metrics are scalar flats. And, and the reason is, is the following. I mean, if you take this, this, uh, the equation there, you can just trace it with the metric, right? So here's what happens. You trace both sides. Now this is just, is, is, is the dimension of the manifold. And this on the other hand, is um, oops, and this on the other hand is the scalar curvature, or or depending on your conventions, uh, it's it's proportional to the scalar curvature. So this this it follows then that the scalar scalar is constant. So Einstein metrics have constant scalar curvature. First thing, okay. So may I, may I ask something? Um, yes, of course. Can you make up a page metric out of uh, Kalabian's? Yes, you can. And uh, well, yes, well, it's exactly the kind of metrics which you can make with what I want to say. You can make the page metric by mixing the Kalabian's, which gives you an extremal metric, not, not an Einstein metric, together with something which I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes, which is Derzinski duality. Uh, the page metric is conformal oh. to the, an extremal Taylor metric. Okay, I see. It's so it, uh, it doesn't uh, specifically produce uh, Taylor metrics then. No, Kalabianza. Uh, well, no, the Kalabianza does produce extremal metrics, which is not what I need. It, it always produces Taylor extremal metrics. Oh, but it's not what the page metric is. Yeah. But on the other hand, the page metric is related. It's conformally related to one of the metrics coming from the Kalabianzats. Okay, so you're kind of getting ahead of me. This is exactly where I'm, where okay. I'm, where I'm moving towards. I, I, I will talk about this in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, uh, what? Okay, so let me tell you. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know uh, what your background is. So let me kind of motivate for you. Uh, why do we care about Einstein manifolds? Okay, so there's there's a, a, a about not not manifolds but Einstein manifolds. Sorry. So there's kind of um, a a really great book 
by Bess, who is not a real person, called Einstein Manifolds. It's sort of a, it's a very influential Romanian geometry book. It's 500 pages, all on Einstein Manifolds. And before he starts in his introduction, he sort of goes to great length to explain why one would care about Einstein manifolds. And so let me let me tell you about let me tell you kind of what he says. He says you should care about Einstein manifolds if you care about topology. Because uh, topology, because uh, there are topological constraints. for the existence. Okay. Uh, you should also care about Einstein manifolds if you care about geometry, differential geometry, particularly in four dimensions, because Einstein manifolds are sort of canonical choice for metric. So their, their Riemannian properties reflect the, oops, reflect the 4D geometry. Okay, you should also care if you like PDEs because, well, the PDE is interesting, but it's it's very much related to other interesting PDEs that people care about, like the Young Mills and whatnot. Okay, and the third the third question he he the third uh, reason he adds is through physics, although you know it's kind of debatable whether these metrics are interesting to physicists or not. But from my perspective, actually. The metrics that are going to arise are such that, so Einstein metrics, they're of a particular kind. And Einstein metrics arise in what's called uh, the ADS CFT correspondence. And so, and this is Witten's idea. And so for this, piece of physics, although I think some physicists would call it math, but for th this part of uh, physics, uh, they are really important. And I, I, I'm going to say a little bit about this in, in my third lecture, I hope. Okay, so these are like, you know, reasons to care. Okay, so, um, so, so one of the sources, I guess one of the greatest sources for Einstein metrics that we have so far. Okay. Okay. So one of the one of the most important sources we have for Einstein metrics these days is scalar geometry. Most of the metrics we know explicitly or you know or with which we are familiar through some way are Kaler. So the source of greatest source for Einstein metrics is is Kaler geometry. And why is that? Well because because we know about what we call Kaler Einstein metrics. Let me So let me uh, speak a bit about this for, for a little while. Okay, so Kähler Einstein metrics. Um, so suppose you have a Kähler manifold. Then G is Kähler Einstein. Well, if it is Kähler and Einstein in a compatible way. And we write it in a very neat way. Uh, so if, if there is a lambda such that the Ricci becomes a two form. And so we write it in this way. And how does the Ricci become a 
form. Well, in this way, it just so happens that this is an actual two form. It's called the Ricci form. And it also happens that its cohomology class is the first turn class of the Kähler manifold. That is the first turn class of the, of the canonical bundle. And so Kähler Einstein implies that the class of the Kähler form must be a multiple of, of the first turn class. Okay, and I'm going to, there's always a dichotomy in this Einstein story. I'm going to focus on the lambda positive. And because of that, we may assume lambda is one. Okay, what do I want to say? So Kähler Einstein, as we've said, has constant scalar curvature. And we have also said that constant scalar curvature uh, implies extrema. I said this last time. And so this is the setting of what I was calling the, well, what everyone calls the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture, which is sort of the hottest conjecture in case of geometry. But, okay, so let me just save. Was. Um, uh, so in this setting, the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture, which is and which is existence of extreme is equivalent to case stability. And I didn't explain what case stability was and I won't. But in the Kähler Einstein setting, the Yao Tian Donaldson conjecture was proved. It was sort of one of the most spectacular achievements of Kähler geometry in the last decades. It, it was proved by Chen, Donaldson, and Sun. And I, I, of course, won't say anything about this. What I will say is that it was proved through a continuity method. It doesn't matter if you don't understand this through a continuity method. You mean the stability, I mean, stability conjecture, right? This one you're talking it, it's about. It's case stability conjecture, yes. Okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, existence of extremal is equivalent mm -hmm. to case stability. Okay. And, through its, and this was proved through a continuity method involving, involving um, uh, a cone angle. So a singular metric, a cone angle, Kähler, Einstein metric uh, with a singularity along the canonical divisor. And the only thing I, I, I want you to uh, take out of this is that cone angle metrics, so metrics with a certain singularity along a divisor became interesting. to Kähler geometers. Maybe they were already before, but they became really interesting to Kähler geometer these days. Okay. Okay, so the upshot is that uh, some uh, uh, Kähler manifolds do not carry Kähler Einstein metrics. I mean, we, we, we knew that before the suggestion. We have all tried to that. It would be unfair not to, not to speak about this. Okay, so, so what are the examples? One was pr precisely what uh, Mustafa was talking about. This, which is just the first year's book, does not carry a Kähler Einstein metric. And this is another famous example, which does not carry an Einstein matrix. Okay, so then the question becomes, if you are interested in Einstein matrix, uh, 
how to find Einstein metrics, I guess, uh, on these two, or more generally, on manifolds without Kähler Einstein metrics. So, without the Kähler geometry to help you, how do you find? How else can you find Einstein metrics? I mean, there are there are other tools, but this brings me to my next topic, which is conformally Kähler's metrics, which is related to the second talk we heard yesterday. So, um, so for me. Uh, suppose you have a manifold. This is maybe a, a you, you probably know this definition, but so suppose you have a manifold and you have a metric. It is it, it's said to be conformally Kähler or conformally Einstein, which is also going to be useful to me. If it if there is a smooth function such that, um, well, a smooth function and G, G0, either Kähler or Einstein, such that this happens. Okay, this is what it means to be conformally Kähler. And, um, uh, I, sh I should say that uh, if, if you were at the second talk yesterday, uh, in 40, conformally Kähler Einstein metrics are exactly Hermitian, are exactly the Hermitian Einstein metrics. Uh, okay, so so now the question, which is, it, it was asked by Levzinski in the 80s. The question is very natural. It's uh, when, the, when is a Kähler manifold conformally Einstein? And of course, this question matters if you want to search for Einstein manifolds, because uh, well, what you're searching for is for uh, Einstein metrics, which are conformally Kähler. OK, and he, he asked the question, but he also answered it. Uh, I mean, there's, he has many interesting results around this sort of question. But the one I want to mention is the one that answers this, this question in the form of a theorem. Um, Okay, he says this. So, so suppose you start with a Kähler manifold. Then uh, there is uh, the conformal factor for an, so there, there is a smooth such that. Uh, Okay, so if and only if GK is what's called back flat, and I owe it to you to explain what this is, and I will, but uh, there's another thing in the theorem that, that matters to me. He also says what the conformal factor is. And well, he says what it is often. It's this. Okay. And so essentially what this does is that um, it tells you that if you 
if you want to find conformally Kähler Einstein metrics, you should find backslap metrics, whatever that is. Okay, and that brings me to my next topic, which is back flatness. Any questions? Okay, so, so to speak about back flat metrics, I have to introduce uh, another piece of information. Suppose you have a Riemannian manifold, then the vial curvature is a 3 1 step that measures conformal flatness. So, what it, what it does is the following um, whenever the vial curvature of a metric is zero, then conformally low the metric is conformally locally flat that means it is and an around each point conformal to the euclidean metric on our ring so the vial the vial tensor is, sort of detects conformal flatness and there is so if m is is compact you can uh, use the the vial curvature to define what's called the vial functional, which is simply, oops, which is simply the norm of the vial curvature squared. Okay, so this is vial functional, and um, um, it, it 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 it's conformally invariant. Okay, so I can now tell you what a back flat metric is. Um, so mg is back flat if g is a critical point for this vial. That is, back flat metrics do for the vial functional what extremal metrics for the Calabi functional. Okay, and. Um, you can, you can, so th this definition so far only works for compact. And in fact, unfortunately, I, I need the non compact setting. But it's also not a practical definition because it's, you know, you, you want something you can check with a calculation. And so what you do is what you do with the same thing you do with the Calabi uh, functional. You write the variations for this functional that is you you calculate this for a, a variation of the metric and you equal it to zero and what you get so the following tensor appears so i'm now going to write a complicated tensor sorry about that okay so so I have a good reason for writing it. Uh, uh, okay. And this is called the Bach tensor. And in fact, uh, G is Bach flat if and only if V of G is zero. Okay, which is, it works in the non-compact setting as well. And what I want you to notice from this formula, which is, you know, I think, oops, at first sight, a bit strange, I think, is that it follows, oh, okay, so what I should say that um, uh, this Ricci zero is what's called the traceless Ricci. That is, it's Ricci minus, its component along the metric direction. It's Ricci minus Ricci energy G. And okay, so why why do I care about this formula? Because from this formula, it follows that we already 
well, there's sort of, we have examples for black flat metrics. Because if G is Einstein, well, I didn't give you examples for Einstein metrics. <laughs> sort of, okay, but, but if G is Einstein, then it's uh, traceless reach is zero. That's precisely what it means to be Einstein. And so, you know, everything that appears here matches. And so it's back flat. Back flat metrics are, the uh, Einstein metric, metrics are examples of, of back flat metrics. Okay, what else can I say about back flat metrics that would help? So let me, let me tell you about the following lemma. If uh, G is back flat and Kähler, so far in, in, in this section, I was, I was not in the Kähler zone, but now suppose I mix back flatness with Kählerness, then G is extremal. And actually a, a proof in the compact case would, would be simple and it's very, it's a cute proof, but I, I guess I, I won't have time to do it. But um, but uh, from the proof, it's it's really obvious that the converse is false. So some extremal metrics, or I should say most extremal metrics, are not back flat. Okay, so um, uh, any questions? Okay, so I'd like to finish. If I do, I, I have. Do I start a bit late. Do I have uh, a couple more minutes or? or yeah, no? sure. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we give okay, you so, some time period to use if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, 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 I'm just mm -hmm. going to say a few words about um, the proof of Derdinsky's theorem, but you know, just I, I'll be very schematic. So let me let me uh, say what this theorem is. He's saying that this metric here is Einstein whenever it's defined, right? Because sometimes the scalar vanishes. He's saying that this metric is Einstein if GK is Bachlat. So you start with something Kähler, and this uh, conformally related metric is Einstein whenever the starting metric is scalar. Okay, so I guess you muted yourself. Uh, we cannot hear you, Rosa.
Rosa, we cannot hear you. Is 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 not yeah. is, is is it okay? Okay. No, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can we couldn't hear. Uh, okay. You said okay. Okay, so I I, I I was actually I was essentially apologizing because this is kind of a it's a bit heavy for the last couple of minutes, but uh, I I um, there is a, a formula for uh, the Ricci of a conformally related metric. In fact, there's a formula for how I mean we 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 understand very well how curvature sh uh, changes under conformal uh, changes. And this is what happens for Ricci. So if you if you apply this formula, so if you apply this formula here, uh, what happens is well the the Ricci. If this happens, uh, okay. Um, no okay, so the first thing you should know is the lemma which is, I, I, I think it's a very well-known lemma. If you have, if, if the Ricci curvature of a metric is a, a multiple, a functional multiple of that metric, then, so normally for Einstein, you would require this F to be constant, but in fact, this implies that F is constant and that G is Einstein. Okay, and what I what I want to show in showing their Dinsky's theorem is that uh, therefore this Ricci here is a multiple of GK or scalar squared. Okay, so this part is okay because it's already a multiple of GK. So I I want to show that this part is a multiple of GK, and now. Okay, so this is where uh, Bach, uh, Kaler and, and, and Extreme will come in. So um, you have that uh, for a Kaler metric, there's a, a different expression for, for the Bach tensor, which is the following. There's a question in the chat also. Oh, oh, let's see. Oh, okay. Yes, I, 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 I gave the definition. It's extremal if it's um, a critical point for, for the Kalabi functional, which is the following. So the Kalabi functional, so it, it, extremal is always Kähler, and the Kalabi functional is very easy to define. It's... Um, Scalar squared of G of GW with respect to the volume. So extremal. So extremal means critical for this. And okay, so uh, the uh, the uh, Euler Lagrangian. Sorry, I put the other word. This or the Euler Lagrange equation for this is the following. So extremal is equivalent to this vector field here being holomorphic. It's what uh, the definition is in the non-compact setting. Sorry, I did I didn't see the 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 question before. Okay, so um uh, okay, so what do I what do I want to say? So the in, in the in the Kähler setting, there's a different um, there's a different uh, 
formula for, for the Bach tensor, which is this one. And it looks very close to what we want, except there's this. But uh, but now, um, sort of, uh, as, I, as I said before, if, if GK is Bach flat, then GK is extremal. And extremal, well, and it's, it's, it's a good thing. I've just reminded you of what the, what the uh, Euler Lagrange gives. Extremal means this. And this actually is just, is equivalent to the Hessian of the scalar curvature is J invariant. So um, back flatness for GK means that, did I, did I put the zero on reach? Yes, and there's a zero here. So back flatness for GK means that uh, means the following. So, mission zero is scalar curvature with GK. Okay, so if 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 you look at this, then this is exactly what you needed to conclude that this Ricci that was in the page before is, it, it, it is exactly, a function times this. And so this implies that this is Einstein. Okay, so let me go back to what I had. It's kind of unfortunate that I have this in two pages. So this, I, I, I just showed you that the traceless part of this is zero. So only the part along GK remains. And therefore, because this is already a multiple of GK, the whole thing is a multiple of GK. And that implies that the whole thing, that GK over scalar squared is Einstein. Okay, so, so, um, so the upshot is that in my search for Einstein metrics, I ended up searching for Bach flat metrics, which are among extremal. And this is how we mix, this is how I'm going to mix the two ingredients next time. Okay, sorry, I went over time and muted myself <laughs> all of that. All right, thank you very much. So we have, as you noticed, we give some time interval for this reason. Thank you very much. Any question? Uh, uh, yes, so, yes. Uh, so there is, um, there is a, uh, a really nice paper by, uh, a really nice paper by Claude Lebrun called back flat it's really called back flat metrics um i think in in bess's book they also talk about uh back flatness but it's it's a huge book so it doesn't what i'm saying doesn't help unless i tell you i can i can look it up and tell you but i think this is a really it's, it's a really good good paper and then there's also um another paper I, so it's a very it's an important paper by um, Chen LeBron Weber, where where they I can, I can't remember the, the title, but it's the only paper by these three authors together, and and what they do is that they build uh, an Einstein metric on CP two two CP two bar by using the method I've just described, by searching for Bach flat metrics. And so they, they spend some time in the, in the introduction um, saying some things about both Bach flatness and Lidzinski's results. 
but uh, but the first paper is sort of is good for background on that. There's also um, there's also Vertinsky's paper, which I think is really nice, but it's it's um, it's very much in coordinates, so it's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, 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 get in. But once you get in, it's really it's a very nice paper. It was about the selected selected bibliography for um, well, flat metrics. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Uh... Uh, what you the theorem the uh, the, the what you talk the, the theorem what you talk is is it the you say that dimension n equal four right yes so oh is yes is it true Ab for another other dimension no sorry absolutely all all of the, all of their Zinsky's work you're you're totally right all of their Zinsky's work is only in four dimensions every, mm -hmm. every, so you can you, most of what I said only works in dimension four. So here is, um, so starting at this point, everything is 4D. So some things don't have to, like the vial, the vial tensor, the vial functional and all of that, but uh, even the formulas for Bach tensor, all of that in the Kähler setting depend on four D. Thank you. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. All right. Any other question? So thanks for uh, Rosa for this nice lecture.